Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews. Bored inside during quarantine? Well, perfect time to pretend to be a vampire. a difference between having a general goth fabulous aesthetic and actually pretending to be a vampire, let's be serious, I for one would never try to make any of you believe that I think I am actually a vampire. But sometimes a girl does like to dream. And for anyone who's ever wished to slip temporarily into a vampire's pallid, bloodless skin for some nocturnal adventures, the World of Darkness role-playing franchise has been providing that very opportunity since the ancient days of 1991. White Wolf's World of Darkness game franchise launched with the tabletop RPG Vampire the Masquerade before it branched out into a shared universe of games involving all your favorite types of monsters. And some monster types we will not mention. But the vampire game has remained the headliner through the company's whole long, complicated history of development. And boy, does it have a long, complicated history. <laughs> the rabbit hole is deep on this one, friends. But in case you were tempted to dive down at yourselves, no need. A couple years ago, a documentary was released telling all about the history, origins, and legacy of White Wolf's World of Darkness. Yes, everything you could possibly ever want to know about this franchise and the huge gaming community surrounding it summed up in one 90-minute film, full of interviews with the game's original creators alongside fans and players representative of all aspects of the intriguing story behind this fandom. So convenient and gothically packaged, right here for you to watch for free on Amazon Prime. Yes, absolutely no need to ever look beyond this documentary now for any information whatsoever about this franchise. Look no further, please, because it's so unbiased and objective and all-encompassing of the true experience of participating in the World of Darkness community throughout the decades. It's not that. It's not that at all. And this documentary is not fooling anyone, unless, and this may be the point, you are coming to it entirely unfamiliar with the games and the companies behind them. Speaking of which, let me quickly explain Vampire the Masquerade for those unfamiliar. So, in this role-playing game, instead of playing like a wizard or a dwarf or an elf or a halfling in a medieval fantasy setting, trawling dungeons and battling monsters, you play different types of vampires. In a dark, gritty, modern, urban fantasy setting, mostly dealing with personal drama and political and religious intrigue. You can play a fancy vampire, a hideous vampire, a tough vampire, a mafia vampire, a magical vampire, so many vampire clans with all your favorite vampire archetypes to choose from. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of supplements to the core game book to expand the ways you can play it. These vampires adhere to the masquerade which is a law restricting them from allowing humans to know that they exist. They must pass themselves off as humans, as normies in everyday life, but can revel in their true selves when they come together in the gaming situations. A lifestyle many a nerd can relate to. Being a vampire is used as a metaphor to explore themes of morality and the complexities of human nature and one of the biggest parts of the game involves resisting giving in to your vampiric urges to the beast within to retain your sense of self. It started off as a pen and paper tabletop game, but quickly got exceedingly popular as a live action role playing game because it's easy to actually look and behave like the characters you're playing. Most of these vampires look like normal people. And since the plot is mostly vampire versus vampire intellectual drama in the real world, 
you don't have to worry about figuring out how to incorporate giant monsters or violent fight scenes or fantastical settings into your LARP. Simply pop in some fangs, find a room somewhere, and you're good to go for a night of improv immersive theater shenanigans with your friends. Sounds cool, right? Yes, it is a very cool and popular game, and people love playing it. The game itself is truly great. Not perfect, of course, but it's up there as far as games go. It is THE vampire role-playing game. No one will ever contest that. However, that is not to say all has been rosy with its history and legacy. There is a lot to unpack surrounding this franchise, the people who created it, and the people who play it. Certainly far more than could ever fit into a 90-minute documentary, but even as presumably a slice of information about the world of darkness, the documentary, well, let's just say it drops some serious blood rose colored glasses over the whole affair. It advertises itself this way. World of Darkness is a documentary about the birth and rebirth of the eponymous RPG universe, going in detail about not just the history of White Wolf and the folks behind the game, but also a look into its many followers and even how Vampire the Masquerade changed the pop culture perception of vampires almost completely. To start, the documentary opens with a few fans and players talking about how awesome the game is and the appeal it had to anyone who's ever felt like an outsider. And absolutely, instead of playing a hero fighting monsters like most games that came before it, playing the monster as a person provides a wonderfully cathartic opportunity. It also puts players in a position to make new friends who understand and sympathize with their feelings of outsideriness. But then, the doc switches to interviews with the creators of White Wolf and the game itself, and they start telling the story of how they came up with it. They compare it often to Dungeons and & Dragons and other similar games that came before, but besides the real people feeling that came with playing these vampires, ironically, the biggest comparison they make is to explain that all previous games were based on statistics and mathematical calculations for determining the outcome of fight scenes, while Vampire was focused much more heavily on storytelling. They credit its story-centric nature with attracting an entirely new crowd of players to gaming. Which was true, it did. But the way they describe these new players, like they were all so sexy and glamorous and cool compared to the losers who played D&D &D and the other games. Well, let's just say the doc left a lot of gamers a touch offended when they watched it. Additionally, as the documentary continues, it intersperses the history lessons with interviews with players who are dressing up for LARP sessions, as well as shots of some of these sessions, and they all just conveniently happen to be particularly attractive people who end up in the footage. Many experienced players who watch this documentary feel it doesn't at all reflect the much more diverse player base who actually enjoy these games. It's like they purposefully edited around all the normal looking people to focus on the hotties. The game makers then go on to talk about how intricately the game was tied in with the 90s club scene, claiming it was a chief influence on the alternative fashion and party culture of the time, as though playing sessions were all a bunch of super cool goth raves. But despite the aesthetic connection in the game's artwork, most gamers are actually much more of the introverted variety. The documentary goes as far as giving the game direct credit for the spread of gothic punk subculture in the 90s. Which, no, that was already happening long before this game. It, it was part of that subculture, a small part, but it sure didn't create it. The documentary also gives the game much credit for the rise in popular urban fantasy literary tropes, like inventing the vampire versus werewolf rivalry, the mashing up of different supernatural characters in the same world, vampires having politics, all elements that existed in plenty of media beforehand, like going all the way back to the 1930s. None of these things were new. 
It brings up a few franchises like the Blade movies, Underworld, and True Blood that we do know directly borrowed ideas from the game's lore, aesthetic from its art, or stories from its tie-in novels, usually without permission or compensation to the game's owners. But the way the documentary presents its influence completely dismisses the much more mainstream contributors to the urban fantasy genre that existed in the world at the same time. And it goes further to take credit for influencing other properties like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and From Dusk Till Dawn without offering any supporting evidence. The game's chief creator talks about how he borrowed ideas from The Hunger, Near Dark, Lost Boys, other popular vampire properties of the 80s, but he says he purposefully avoided letting himself read Anne Rice. He then admits that he realized afterward that Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles were what had directly influenced all of his influences in the first place. All these 80 vampire movies that I love so much all stole their stuff from Anne Rice. But Vampire the Masquerade isn't the only baby franchise thing the Vampire Chronicles spawned. Urban fantasy as a genre, which is supernatural creatures like vampires, werewolves, fairies, witches, everything, existing in our modern real world, either in secret or out in the open. That genre in general became a huge thing in literature, movies, television in the 90s, pumped out by creatives with no connection to Vampire the Masquerade or gaming whatsoever, all influenced by the same vampires the game was influenced by. Things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer certainly had common ancestors to World of Darkness, but this was convergent evolution, not a direct line of succession. The documentary brings in a film critic academic to discuss the way the pop culture perception of vampires changed after Anne Rice's interview with the vampire. Anne Rice's interview with the vampire was a real turning point for a number of reasons, but the single biggest one I think was that it pushed the sexuality of vampire stories even farther forward. The sexuality? That was your biggest takeaway from Interview with the Vampire? Did we read the same book? The Vampire Chronicles did so much more than that. They pushed sympathy, empathy for the vampire. For the first time, really, it allowed all those real life social outcasts to identify with the vampire in a sympathetic way. The contemporary idea of they were tragic, romantically cursed creatures, ones you could sympathize with and arguably want to be with. See, this guy gets it, but more like sympathetic creatures you felt like you could be, right? Especially if you're a lonely bookish nerd who society rejects. And one thing this documentary really gets right is the appeal of the game, the appeal of the vampire in general, to its players. I love getting to be something else and like creating this character. It's a yeah. fun way to express yourself. LARP gives me a cheaper alternative to therapy to explore myself. Playing the dark side takes me away from my ordinary life. I have always been out of place. I never really fit in. I like dressing up like a monster. It gives me more of an assertive feel and I can be myself because this is basically me. Here you are, an outsider, getting to play the ultimate outsider. It's so nice to belong, you know, to a clan or a pack and to have a clear purpose. As soon as you join in, the community is lovely. Uh, hold on, uh, about that last point. So besides giving themselves credit for significantly upping the coolness and sexiness level of the average RPG player, the game's creators also take full credit for bringing women into the RPG communities. Suddenly, there were women at Gen Con. Women did enjoy the storytelling nature of the vampire game much more than they'd been previously interested in the male power fantasy nature of other games more focused on smashing and bashing and winning gold from getting high scores. But although there were and are a much greater percentage of women playing vampire, having almost a 50% ratio of women was unheard of. That didn't mean the playing experience wasn't still a boys club. Of course, it all depends on who you play with, but Many women found the community at large just as misogynist, patronizing, and frustrating as other games where the male players belittled and targeted women. 
the countless instances of sexual harassment and sexual assault people endured for decades were completely swept under the rug. The game company itself, as well as leaders in the player community, consistently ignored complaints and refused to take measures to ensure players' safety until very recently. Just the past few years, it, it's getting better now, but there is nothing in this documentary that even remotely addresses this very open secret about women and vulnerable people's experiences in the World of Darkness community. And all the women players we get to hear from, besides being especially hot, gush about how perfect the community is and how accepted and supported they've always felt. Getting to hang out and be with people that were just as into these strange little ideas as I was. The world of darkness and the LARP community, it's very close-knit. As soon as you join in, the community is lovely. You find this really broadening network that you can connect with. The documentary then takes a turn in tone to discuss the years of hardship the franchise suffered when digital gaming began to overtake the landscape and how the company struggled to maintain profits. It mentions White Wolf's string of lawsuits and the way the company lost faith with its fans when it sued its own fan club for using a trademarked name. But the documentary presents this notorious controversy with the gentlest of gloves, only actually stating the facts in a title card, not out loud, before presenting the affronted feelings of the fans. Also, it gives the lawsuit happy owners a chance to defend their litigious nature before the film takes a hard swing back into talking about how much the fans love the game. And all the exciting things the company did to try to increase profits, I mean, revitalize its content. Also, the last thing we get to hear from them is how humbled they were by their success. When you have somebody come up to you and say, it changed my life. You're just humbled by that. Like, it's just like writing the books changed our lives too. Really movie, not, not gonna mention maybe like the time the company put a line in the membership that said they could use any player's likeness, characters, plot lines, or any related writing without the player's permission or compensation. No, just hammer in how humble everyone is. Okay. We get to hear about the ups and downs of the way the company attempted to introduce new properties, reboot and remarket the core game, and their ventures into video game development to capitalize on the digital market. However, when it discusses the notorious debacle surrounding the MMORPG that never got finished, it spends far more time on the excitement of its development rather than the disappointment of its failure. As the death of the MMO was the last event of note to happen in the game's history, this would be a bummer of an ending for such an otherwise generally glowing commercial, I mean, documentary. So once more, it ramps the tone back up to remind us how great it feels to play this game, how therapeutic it is to express the darker side of your inner self through your vampire character, how special it will make you feel. And then, just in case you were still doubting that inner voice suspecting that this whole documentary might just be a glorified commercial designed as the parent company's latest attempt to revitalize interest in their fading IP, we're faced with one of the few hired actors the doc uses for dramatic reenactment. We are a force to be reckoned with. Our hope is to rise again to reignite that passion that we used to feel and to drink in a new generation. And then we are presented with this title card. And as a final cap, once more, it's hammered in how sexy and cool this gaming community is, along with being so diverse and accepting. Not like all those other games. Only vampires can offer this. Our hope is to rise again and to drink in a new generation. Who are you supposed to be, hired actor lady? A vampire? A player? A company PR rep? Rise again and drink in a new generation of customers? By releasing a documentary glorifying how awesome you are that only does the barest minimum to mention the company's flaws in order to grant plausible deniability to the fact that cleaning up your reputation for financial profit is your only goal with this film? No 
Oh, Maven, you say? That's a bold accusation. There's absolutely nothing in the credits that implies the parent company had anything to do with the production of this documentary. How do you know it wasn't simply conceived and made by someone who loved the game muchly and wanted to pay it tribute? Well, I don't. So call me Mistress Vampire Tinfoil Hat tonight, if you like. But whether it was intentional or not, there's no denying that this documentary feels like a straight-up recruitment propaganda video. Uncle Vlad wants you to spend money on this franchise. But Maven, you say? Who cares? Well, you got me there. The long-term fans of this game have been through so many disappointments with the shenanigans of the game's creators and the various companies and corporations that have owned the franchise over the years that when this documentary came out, no one was in an uproar about how tone deaf it comes across. Some eyes were rolled, some cape collars were flipped, and that was about it. Clearly this film wasn't made for them who were well aware of all the decades of dirty laundry it glossed over. Well, I've found no evidence that this documentary was in any way successful in launching fresh interest in the game for new players. It's barely made a blip on the landscape since it came out two years ago. The existing fans continue to play the game in the way that's brought them joy for the past three decades, despite its problematic associations. And especially in consideration of all the upsetting nonsense that's happened since this film came out, uh, like with V5 and so forth, I can't help compare being part of this fandom to how so many Harry Potter fans feel now. Like, we know J.K. Rowling is a turf and has done some pretty racist shit, but that doesn't mean the good of the story itself and the communities it spawned aren't still meaningful and important to the fans. You can separate art from the artist when the art has worthwhile significant themes that shaped your formative existence, touched your little vampiric heart. Even if it never makes the owners of its IP coffin loads of money again, the World of Darkness franchise isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And for very good vampire reasons. It's not the vampire's fault. It's never the vampire's fault! I'm the Maven of the Eventide, and these vampires speak to people. They always have. Nobody needed this ridiculously gaslighty documentary to tell us that. Thank you, Patreon patrons, for supporting my vampire videos. Thank you for being there for me during this really rough time. I know things are scary in the world right now, but if vampire media commentary helps make your life a little bit easier, I am so happy to be able here to be here to give it to you and that you are here to help me give it to you. So thank you so much. We are working together to make this world a little more vampire-y and a little less scary, as ironic as that is. Thank you. Good night.